friends, and welcome to Spilling Studio. My name is Sam, and this week we have seven new ARE practice questions for you. These questions are designed to get you one step closer to passing your next exam. We have one question per exam and a bonus question at the end, so stick around. First up is practice management. An architect has designed a two-story house for an owner. The architect finishes the design and construction is about to begin. However, the owner terminates their contract due to personal reasons. A year later, the owner decides to restart the project, but hires a different architect. How can the project proceed without violating copyright protection in B101? Check all that apply. The original architect can transfer copyright to the owner. Since the owner paid through completion of the construction document phase, the owner can use the drawings as needed. The new architect can redesign the house, pay the original architect a licensing fee. Feel free to pause here to answer. And the answer is the original architect can transfer copyright to the owner. The new architect can redesign the house or the owner can pay the original architect a licensing fee. AIA document B101 states that the architect is the owner of the instruments of service and retains all common law, statutory and other rights, including copyrights. If the owner terminates the owner architect agreement for convenience, then the owner is not allowed to use the architect's instrument of service. To use the original design, the owner can pay the architect a licensing fee to use the instruments of service. However, the owner cannot then license the instrument of service to anyone else. It's solely for their use. If the owner wants to do that, then they would need written consent from the architect. The architect can assign the copyright to the owner or the new architect can redesign the house from scratch. Now, when you think of copyrights, the first thing you may think of is reproduction, how those are a big no-no like with arts and graphics. However, B101 allows the owner, contractor, and subcontractors to reproduce instruments of service solely and exclusively for construction of the project. Now on to project management. Who is responsible for hiring and paying for a geotechnical engineer? Contractor, architect, owner, landscape subconsultant. Pause here to answer. The answer is the owner. The owner is responsible for securing geotechnical services. These services include borings, soil bearing values, percolation tests, and the evaluation of hazardous materials. The owner can ask the architect for assistance with securing these services and recommending trustworthy companies. The owner is also required to provide surveys that show the topography, utility locations, easements, and other aspects of the site. Once the contract is executed between the contractor and owner, the contractor is then responsible for paying inspection fees and testing fees. Next up is programming and analysis. Our question is, a local house is registered on the National Register of Historic Places and is in need of repair. The masonry home requires cleaning and replacement of bricks. Which method should be used? Sandblast the bricks and grout to remove debris. Use a hammer to remove mortar from joints. Use natural bristles to clean the brick and hand raking to repoint mortar. Replace damaged bricks with concrete bricks so they will last longer. Pause to answer. And the answer is use natural bristles to clean the brick and hand raking to repoint mortar. The National Park Service developed the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Within these guidelines, it states that no harsh chemicals, sandblasting hammers, and or electric blades are to be used on historic properties. Instead, the gentlest method possible should be used, such as cleaning with low pressure water, detergents, and natural brushes. Mortar repointing is to be hand raked. Mortar should match the composition, color, texture, and profile. Concrete bricks should not be used to replace clay bricks since the guidelines to historic restoration states, 
where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of distinctive feature, the new feature will match the old in design, color, texture, and where possible, materials. On the left, you'll see an example from the Secretary of Interior's guidelines for restoring historic buildings. This is showing what should be done for a restoring masonry project and what shouldn't. The image they provide is a very obvious mix of materials that should not have been approved. I've linked the restoration guidelines in the description if you'd like to check them out. Our project planning question is, an owner would like assistance selecting an elevator control system for their new office building. The owner would like to reduce travel time and have the occupants choose which floor they're going to in the elevator lobby, not the car. Which elevator control system should the architect propose? Single automatic, selective collective, group automatic, destination floor guidance. Pause here to answer. The answer is destination floor guidance. The destination floor guidance system allows occupants to choose which floor they like to visit in the elevator lobby. Inside the elevator, there are no buttons. The system analyzes all the rider's requests on various floors and assigns a car based on similar destinations. This system has lower travel time and less stops for each car. Single Automatic was the first operating system that didn't require elevator attendance. They have a single call button for each floor. The elevator can only be called if no one is using it. Once the rider is inside, they have complete use of the car until they've reached their destination. As you can imagine, this is a slower operating system and is only practical for small buildings with little traffic. Selective collective operation is the most common operating system. The elevator answers calls in one direction and then reverses and answers calls in the opposite direction. Once riders are done, the elevator can be set to return to a specific floor, like the lobby. Without specifications of the control system for the video here, it appears these cars are running on selective collective control system. Group automatic operation is typically used for large buildings with multiple elevators. This system uses programmable microprocessors to answer calls as efficiently as possible. Group automatic can also include variables like time of day or week, so the elevator can go to a specific floor when needed. I post new questions every week, so please hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a video. Now on to project development. An architect is working on a classroom building in the state of Montana. Which fire sprinkler system should be specified? Pre-action, dry pipe, deluge, wet pipe. Pause here to answer. The answer is dry pipe. Dry pipe systems are used in location where freezing is frequent. The pipes are filled with compressed air or nitrogen. Once the heads are activated and open, then water flows to fill the pipes. Pre-action is similar to dry pipe, but the water is allowed to fill the pipes before the heads open. There is a slight delay between when the alarm goes off and heads open to give firefighters time to respond. Because of this delay, the system is used in areas where water damage is a concern, like museums. In a deluge system, all heads are activated at once and are kept open until the pipes are empty. Valves automatically open when the alarm is activated. This system is used in high hazard areas where fire is likely to spread very quickly, like in labs or chemical warehouses. Wet pipe systems are most common. Pipes are filled with water at all times, and once the temperature reaches between 135 to 170 degrees, the heads open. Flow detectors are placed in zones. Once the sensors notice water is flowing from the heads, a signal is sent to the annunciator panel so that firefighters know where the fire is located. Wet pipe and dry pipe are pretty easy to remember. Dry pipe has no water, wet pipe does. 
For pre-action, I used to tell myself that it allows firefighters to take action. That's how I never forgot that one. Deluge is the opposite of pre-action. It floods right away. Next up is construction evaluation. Who is typically the initial decision maker? Owner, contractor, architect. Pause here to answer. And the answer is architect. This question comes from AIA document A101 between the owner and the contractor. When a claim is filed, they are first referred to the initial decision maker, who is the architect. The owner and contractor may also name a third party initial decision maker on their owner contractor agreement. The IDM can approve or reject a claim. This decision is final and binding, but the claiming party may make a demand for mediation. Typically, claims are filed for additional time or due to concealed or unknown conditions. I've linked a sample PDF of contract A101 in the description. I highly suggest you read this. It's super short, only eight pages, and it'll really help you out on your construction evaluation exam. This week's bonus question focuses on project development. Wastewater from sinks and dishwashers is considered which of the following? Check all that apply. Potable water, sanitary drainage, storm drainage, black water, gray water. Pause to answer. And the answer is sanitary drainage and gray water. Sanitary drainage includes any drainage that contains food or human waste. Sanitary can be broken down further into gray water and black water. Black water is wastewater from toilets, which contain human waste. Gray water is all other wastewater, such as that from sinks, dishwashers, and laundry machines. The reason these are separated is because gray water has the ability to be reused with little or no treatment for things like irrigation and flushing toilets. Black water requires excessive treatment for reuse or disposal. Storm water comes from roof runoff, road runoff, and landscaped areas. That wraps up our questions for this week. Please go ahead and leave a comment below with a topic you'd like covered in the next video and let me know how well you did this week. Thank you all for joining. Please subscribe. Good luck on your next exam and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.